the, the program has changed slightly. Dr. Braddock Riggs will be speaking about the 10 emergencies you will be seeing in your office rather than Dr. Bidoff. So Dr. Briggs is a local family practice doctor here in town. And Brennan, come on up. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm honored to be asked to speak at the conference today. Most of you I know through residency. I did residency at McKady Hospital, and so uh, I think that most, or I feel that most of the knowledge that I have in medicine came from all of you, so I'm not sure why I'm uh, up here presenting, but, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share with you some things that we see in our urgent care out in Roy. Uh, lastly, let me say I'm, I'm a little nervous. Um, Usually the group that I uh, present to are 14 to 18-year-old boys. I get to work in the scouting uh, realms, and I've had a couple of conversations here with other uh, boy scouters. And uh, so if you just pretend like you're completely ignoring me and uh, maybe, uh, you know, talk about girls, you guys, that would uh, really put me at ease as to, uh, to this presentation today. Uh, we're going to talk about 10 common complaints that we see in our office. Um, Something in the eye, which we've talked about earlier in the conference, uh, bleeding noses. Dr. Bikazi did a, uh, a uh, breakout session on that yesterday, which uh, unfortunately I was not able to make. Um, being hit in the mouth, a cut on my hand, and we'll have a personal story about Boy Scouts for that one. Uh, a stray dog bit me. I think I broke something. We're going to talk about the Ottawa ankle rules. I stepped on a nail uh, and how that relates to tetanus, which everybody's concerned about. Uh, my back is killing me, which I think there are some days where that's 95% of my, my practice, I think, uh, patients coming in wanting me to talk to them about their backs. Uh, I have strep throat because everybody's convinced that any sore throat is a strep throat and their bronchitis is back. First, we're going to talk about I got something in my eye. Now, this gentleman probably qualifies for number one and number two. I think once he removes the finger, we'll be having a bloody nose. Uh, so we'll get on with the something in the eye. Um, usually the history is pain, tearing, and a foreign body sensation in the eye. They have light sensitivity with some blepharospasm and a history of trauma or extended contact, wear, contact lens wearing. On physical, we'll often find bulbar conjunctival injection, uh, if the, uh, palpebral, think conjunctivitis. Visual acuity should be normal on exam. And uh, in our office, we use a wood lamp and fluorescene dye uh, to check where the corneal epithelial cells have been damaged. And this is a pretty easy test. Anybody can do that in our office, and it's very helpful for us to determine uh, the cause and exactly where their uh, corneal abrasion is. A couple of pearls with foreign bodies. You can use a pinhole to check visual acuity if the patient forgot their glasses. This will compensate for their visual acuity issues. Uh, topical anesthetic helps with the exam. Uh, it's hard to get somebody to open their eye and look into a wood light if they're continually closing their eyelid. Cycloplegics, about 20 to 30 minutes before the exam, can help ease the spasm. And if you don't have a slit lamp in your office, then, of course, you can use the wood lamp and the fluorescein. Uh, a poor man's slit lamp, you can actually use the fluorescent ceiling lights uh, to take a look. Uh, on the uh, on the cornea, the bodies uh, behind the cornea. Uh, you need to always make sure that you revert the eyelid as well. Uh, foreign bodies don't just sit right out there where they can be seen. Sometimes they get stuck in the upper lid or the lower lid, and uh, we need to be checking there for foreign bodies. Fluorescein, by the way, can permanently stain soft contact lenses. So first of all, you, they should not be having soft contact lenses in their eye when you're doing this exam. And second of all, you need to let them know, hey, don't pop your contact lenses right back in as soon as we get out of here. You may want to leave them off for 24 hours. And then a tetanus update if needed. Now, that being said, this is just an opportunity to update their tetanus. Uh, we'll talk about tetanus and eyes here. There have been 38 cases of tetanus due to an eye injury between 1847 and 1993 in the medical literature. 
That's not a lot, right? 33 of those involved a perforated globe. I don't see that in my office. So really, my reason for updating tetanus has not much to do with the risk of the foreign body. It has more to do with an opportunity to update them if they need it because they may be stepping on that dangerous nail next week. And so then they'll be updated already. Um, none of those patients that uh, got tetanus from an eye injury was from just a simple corneal abrasion. Uh, the uh, uh, topical anesthetics, there's two that we commonly use, tetracaine and propericaine. The tetracaine tends to be a little bit more stinging in the eyes, so in the pediatric population, they're not big fans of that. Uh, onset is a little bit slower with the tetracaine, but it does tend to last a little bit longer if you're not going to be able to get in there and see the patient right away. The only time in our office that we put anything in the eyes is after the visual acuity exam is done because we want to make sure that we document that visual acuity was what it was when they entered the office, that we didn't necessarily cause anything by something that we put in the eye. Um, don't send patients home with topical anesthetics. Prolong it feels good and they feel great, but prolonged use of the topical anesthetic can cause keratitis and therefore slow down and compromise healing. If you're going to irrigate the eye, make sure you use a neutral solution. This is checked easily by using a uh, urine dipstick in the office. And uh, one of the slickest ways to do that is use some oxygen tubing. You actually cut off the oxygen tubing. You put the prongs over the bridge of the nose so it's right near the, the folds of the eye there. And then you put that normal uh, neutral solution into the eye and it will irrigate rather well. So to patch or not to patch, that's the question. Um, there's been six studies about patching the eye. Um, in regards to pain, there was no difference in four of the studies, whether they patched or didn't patch. And actually in two out of the six, pain was made worse by patching the eye. There were no difference in complications. And so the recommendation is if the patient feels better, have them patch the eye. If it doesn't feel better to the patient, they don't need to. Antibiotic eye drops. Routine use of antibiotic eye drops for foreign bodies is rather controversial. There are several available. Many of them are listed here, but there's really no medical literature that indicates there is an advantage to using that in simple foreign bodies and foreign body removals. Um, so a couple of pearls. Scratch from a contact lens, however, you need to use antibiotic. You need to cover gram negatives, especially pseudomonas, um, because you're worried about infection and ulcers for those folks that have extended wear of those contact lenses. Make sure you avoid neomycin. A lot of people are allergic to it or at least have a uh, adverse response to it. It may not be a true allergy, and so you want to avoid neomycin drops for those folks. Uh, Anti-inflammatory drops. Um, they decrease cyclooxygenase activity. They lower the prostaglandin precursor, and so therefore you get less prostaglandin synthesis and actually, with non-steroidals and soft contact lens wearers, they may give some symptomatic relief uh, and preserve the binocular vision. If you look at the cost of these, however, diclofenac and Catorolac are the two common ones. Both of them are around $45 for a 5cc bottle. That's about $9 per milliliter, $270 an ounce, $2,160 per cup, $9,000 per liter and $37,854 per gallon, possibly reaching what we'll be paying for gas this summer. So uh, just be aware of the cost of those antibiotics when you're, uh, or the non-steroidals when you're using those. Uh, the one thing that I think ophthalmology has done amazingly well is color-coded their bottles. So when you pick up an, a bottle with an ophthalmologic uh, solution in it, you know exactly what it's for. Uh, not all other specialties of medicine have seemed to do that quite as well. And, uh, and so this is just listed here, uh, what you can be looking for based upon the color of the bottle that you have in your hand. Okay, my nose won't stop bleeding. In our office, when we approach problems, we tend to focus on the problem, and then we try to take a little bit of a global view to see what's the effect of everybody else in the office. This cartoon says, uh, this man in the middle has his nose bleed. He says, this has to stop happening every time we take the 50,000 foot view. Um, my nose won't stop bleeding. Seems like a pretty uh, exciting emergency. Lots of folks will show up because they think they've lost 
leaders upon leaders of blood, and uh, it just looks far more exciting than probably what they've actually lost. There's a bimodal incidence, uh, age peaks between 2 and 10 years old. What I tell my patients is the most common cause in that population, the, most, the number one cause, is this right here. <laughs> uh, it's the finger. Hopefully that's not the same for our 50 to 80-year-olds. That tends to be a little bit different. Often it will be medications. Uh, it can also be the climate in which we live. Uh, cold months, we tend to get uh, much more common with this presentation. And then a dry climate, which we live in the high desert. Uh, we may have gotten a lot of water and a lot of snow this year, but it is still a desert. Some drugs that may predispose that older population, of course, aspirins, aspirin, non-steroidals, Coumadin, um, Clopidogrel, etc. You need to take a full history of their uh, medication. Um, greater than 90% of nosebleeds can be treated by a non-ENT physician. Anterior nosebleeds tend to be the Kieselbach plexus, that's anterior in the septum. Posterior nosebleeds are below the posterior half of the inferior turbinate. Now what about ice packs? Ice packs, I see patients come in all the time with ice packs on their forehead and I think, okay, what are we doing here? So we, we took a look at some studies. Um, forehead ice packs, there is actually no change or actually a slight increase in nasal flow. If you put intraoral ice or an intraoral ice pack, I think kids would rather, people would rather put ice in their mouth than an ice pack, you can actually reduce the nasal blood flow by about 23% in almost half of your patients. So that may be helpful for those folks. Vasoconstriction. Uh, that was discussed a little bit earlier today. You want to make sure before you do anything you have the patient blow their nose. This decreases the local fibrinolysis and removes blood clots before you do the, uh, apply the vasoconstrictor. Uh, local anesthetic reduces the pain of the exam and also they'll tolerate packing a lot easier if you'll use either cocaine, which we don't have in our office. I don't know if many of you carry that there, but we just don't carry cocaine in our office. But uh, you can use the ZAP or the LET, which was discussed earlier today. Um, create a little pledge it by unrolling a cotton ball um, until it's about 10 to 12 inches long. You soak it in the vasoconstrictor and the, uh, the um, local anesthetic, wring it to where it's near dry, and then you just lay it in the nose with your bayonet forceps, particularly if it's a posterior bleed you can get it back there with the, with the bayonet forceps, leave it in for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then pull it out. Chemical cautery. We use a silver nitrate stick in our office, particularly for anterior bleeds in the Kieselbach plexus, making sure that we don't cauterize both sides of the nose. But I'll tell you that I can probably count on one hand how many times I've seen you know, bilateral nares nosebleeds. Typically, it's one side that's bleeding most significantly. So you just roll the tip of your silver nitrate stick across the mucosa there. It turns gray and uh, pretty well stops and cauterizes the bleeding. There are some sponges commercially available. Uh, these are listed here. The Maricel sponge uh, will expand inside the nasal cavity and, and uh, tamponade the bleeding, more often used in posterior bleeds. Um, Oxacel, Surgicel, gel foam. Uh, et cetera, that can be used for, again, those, uh, these are absorbable sponges that can be used for the posterior nosebleeds as well. After packing, these are things you want to make sure that you do. Observe for at least an hour. You don't just say, oh, it stopped, and you let them go five minutes out your door. They need to be watched for a little while to make sure they don't re-bleed because they'll be back fairly soon if you do that. Um, if you're just observing the patient sitting in your chair laying on your exam table, that's not what they're going to be doing at home. And so you may want to have them walk around the clinic a little bit, go take a walk outside, come back in, make sure that it's completely stopped. And then you can also uh, use a mustache dressing under the nose to catch any seepage that may be coming out over, uh, over time. Do you do coagulation studies on everybody walking through the doors with nosebleeds? This test tested 140 patients that were admitted for epistaxis. Uh, coagulation studies were done in 86%. Abnormalities were identified in 8.3%, but those were the ones that we would expect anyway because they were all taking warfarin. Uh, two patients had abnormal platelets when we checked the CBC, but again, those patients we already knew had uh, myelodysplastic disorder, and so that was not a surprise to, uh, to finding out on the coagulation studies. 
follow up on a nosebleed, do you do prophylactic antibiotics? Uh, there is a small risk of sinusitis, a risk of toxic shock syndrome, uh, but the data is a little shaky in this category. And so if you are going to use antibiotics, amoxicillin is usually the drug of choice, uh, dose TID until the packing is removed, and you only remove the packing about 48 to 72 hours later. So it's not a 7 to 10 day course, it's a very short course. You get them on, you get them off. When they come back in for removal of the packing, you take them off the antibiotic. Pitfalls of nosebleeds. Failure to apply pressure for 10 minutes. In an adult, 10 minutes is not long. In a kid, try to get them to sit still for 10 minutes while you apply pressure. It's like trying to dress an octopus. It's a little tough. Failure to pack the nose properly. Failure to do that little walk around that we talked about in the clinic, which is what they're going to be doing at home. You may as well do it in the clinic to make sure you've stopped the bleeding. Failure to give an antibiotic, again, the, that is the standard of care. However, there's not a lot of data to support that, uh, as it seems there's other things in medicine along those lines. And then failure to stop aspirin therapy or drug therapy if you're able to. Obviously, if a patient has uh, uncontrolled AFib, et cetera, you don't want to pull them off their Coumadin. You may want to talk to the cardiologist and let them know uh, what's going on in your office. Now, nasal trauma. Who needs x-rays? How do we determine who needs x-rays when they walk through our door? First of all, as was mentioned, uh, I believe, yesterday, uh, we don't do nasal x-rays in our office because I'm not comfortable reading them. It will take some time for the radiologist to read them. And mainly, uh, we feel that when someone has a fractured nose, it tends to be fairly obvious, and this uh, supports that data. Um, 75 patients in this study were seen by an ENT, 89% of them were x-rayed, 61% of those had fractures, but treatment for those fractures and assessment of those fractures was based solely on the clinical examination in every single one of those patients. Management was not influenced by the x-ray itself. Pitfalls of uh, trauma nosebleeds, failure to identify and treat a septal hematoma and then a persistent bleed after trauma, which could be a failure to rule out a CSF leak. Uh, as our uh, esteemed colleague at the prison indicated yesterday, you can have some pretty significant trauma and uh, they present with just bleeding. And so you want to make sure that you're not missing uh, significant issues. I got hit in the mouth. It's coming up on baseball season. Brian, you play a little softball. That's a common injury out on the field, and so as it gets warmed up here, we're going to see that more and more frequently. This is our beloved President Barack Obama playing basketball with a few of his buddies. He got an elbow to the mouth. This was just last fall. Had to get 12 stitches in the mouth. Luckily, it was a Democrat, not a Republican, so everything's okay. Um, when you get hit in the mouth, there's uh, about 5 million avulsed teeth per year in the United States. Uh, we have to worry about chipped teeth as well, tongue lacerations, and then whether or not we choose to treat those with antibiotics. In a tooth, there are three layers to a tooth. There's the enamel, which is the outside, very hard structure. Dentin is a little bit softer on the inside. And then pulp. The crown of the tooth is above the gum line. The root is below the gum line. And we all have about 32 permanent teeth. The Ellis classification, uh, which is the common classification for dentists and physicians to use for uh, teeth uh, avulsion, teeth injuries, Ellis type 1 is just a cosmetic injury. A small tooth or a small portion of the tooth is chipped off and doesn't get to the dentin. Ellis type 2, the dentin is, is exposed and it's covered with a soft calcium hydroxide. And then Ellis type 3, uh, is when the uh, pulp is exposed and looks somewhat like a drop of blood uh, that just hangs there. Uh, that requires immediate uh, intervention if you're going to save that tooth. If you do get a tooth knocked out, you rinse it with water, but you don't scrub it because you can remove some of that pulp from the tooth. Hold it gently by the crown and not the root because the, cr the root is very sensitive. And in a cooperative adult, you can actually gently put the tooth back into the socket, hold it there for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then make your way to seek medical attention. If you can't put the tooth back in, you transport that tooth in saline 
milk or saliva, and that's going to, we're going to come back to that here in another part of the, uh, the lecture. Um, and a dry tooth, if you don't put it in a tooth saver solution, a dry tooth can damage within just a couple of minutes. And so you want to make sure that that's done fairly quickly. In a child or an uncooperative adult, again, you put it in the tooth saver solution. Um, if it's loosened, just gently push it back in. Um, or if you have broken teeth, you want to make sure you avoid eating or drinking until you get it taken care of. Tooth, uh, teeth that are broken in pieces, retrieve the parts and transport those because often they can be now with the miracles of dentistry, uh, they can be put back and, and glued back onto the tooth itself. Um, Ninety percent of replantations were reimplantations performed within 30 minutes were successful. If you waited longer than that, you can see it drastically fell to about five percent if you were out two hours after the tooth was out. Um, again, you slowly insert it into the socket and then uh, hold for pressure. And then consult the dentist. They're going to put wires in the mouth and hold that tooth with bracings to the other teeth uh, for about two weeks. Once two weeks is surpassed, then that tooth is pretty well solid in there, and they'll take the wires out of your mouth, and you can go back to eating. Um, the arch bars or the wires is what we talked about. If it's a baby tooth, you don't need to worry about it. Baby teeth tend to be a bluish-white. Um, permanent teeth are a yellowish-white. That's one of the ways that you can tell a difference. Um, and uh, no long-term problems are anticipated if it's just simply the, the baby tooth that got knocked out. What about getting smacked in the mouth? Um, this is what our president went through with an elbow to the mouth. You want to make sure you remove debris from the mouth, irrigate the mouth copiously. Avoid radical debridement, though, because uh, we can damage the tissue that has been lacerated in the mouth. And you can close lacerations within the mouth up to 24 hours after the initial injury. So you have some time there. It's not uh, an immediate thing. Uh, if you're going to give an antibiotic, and this is only recommended for through and through injuries, if it goes through the mucosa and out into the lip, then you want to give some penicillin, or if they're penallergic, you give erythromycin uh, for this. But there's really not a lot of studies. That's just standard of care. Not a lot of studies to support that. Tongue cuts. You don't usually need stitches for tongue cuts. Uh, cheek and lip cuts. You only need to close those if it looks like it's formed a pocket and food is going to get stuck uh, inside the mouth with, uh, with that pocket that's formed. And if a frenulum is cut underneath the tongue, you just let it heal. There's no, no reason for intervention at that point. I cut my hand. Okay, so here's the personal story about scouting. Last year, my scouts were doing a service project. We're actually mowing my neighbor's lawn, and the mower was a bit too high. So they said, Riggs, can you come over and lower the mower? And me, not thinking, and I'm with scouts, so, you know, that seems to be a fairly common thing. I grab the body of the mower with my right hand, and I go to change the height on the cog with my left hand. As I grip the body of the mower, my long finger goes underneath the mower, and it cuts that tip off. And I hear it before I feel it. I hear that the, the blade slowed down for a second, and then I went, oh, that kind of hurts. <laughs> so... I run in the house, I wash it off, and me, being a man, put a paper towel over it and go back outside. <laughs> and my wife comes running after me saying, no, we're going to the hospital. <laughs> and I said, but I have to mow. And she says, no, you don't. So we go to the hospital. Um, the plastic surgeon was called in. He says, Dr. Riggs, we can do a couple of things. We can cut the rest of your tip of your finger off and do a skin flap. We can attach it to the back of your other finger, which I'm thinking, how do I work with that? Or we can just wait and see what happens. So I said, I vote for option three. Let's wait and see what happens. Uh, as you can see, I have a full finger on my middle finger of my right hand, and there's just a little scar on the tip. It was amazing to watch that heal. Um, incidentally, I said I would go back to the milk thing. My scouts called. They said, Riggs, we found the end of your finger. Do you, wanna, do you want us to put it in milk? <laughs> so... We had an opportunity to review first aid uh, when I healed up. <laughs> uh, hand injuries account for about 5.5% of all emergency room visits. Males, probably for obvious reasons, tend to have this happen more commonly than females do. 60% of those are ages between 16 and 32, 
Lacerations account for a little over 60%, and fractures are found in a little over 10%. The most frequent one, of course, is the one that I did, the distal phalanx of the long finger. It's the one that sticks out there the most and gets in the way of fast-spinning blades. Um, prophylactic antibiotics. The question is, do you need to put them on antibiotics? Uh, this study uh, took a look at 105 clean hand wounds treated within six hours of injury. They were put on five days of placebo versus two doses, two different doses of Keflex at four times a day. Placebo, as you can see, had two infections that required subsequent antibiotic treatment. Low-dose Keflex had two infections that required going up to high-dose Keflex, and then two infections on the high-dose category that required switching categories. Now, incidentally, the surgeon that I saw was smart and said, hmm, lawnmower blades, not a clean hand wound. And uh, he says, I know what lawnmower blades go through besides grass, so we're putting you on some Keflex, and so I took Keflex for about 10 days. Uh, irrigation solution was talked about earlier today. You want to make sure you're not using a cytotoxic irrigation solution. And that was the povidone iodine or the hydrogen peroxide that will kill those cells. Uh, again, the ratio is one cc of the provodone iodine solution, iodine solution to 10 liters of water, and uh, that should be your irrigation solution. There's that listing there. Now, soaking the wound. Uh, if you soak the wound in your iodine, it doesn't change anything. You've just soaked the wound. It doesn't change the bacteria count. If you soak it in normal saline, actually you may be risking more incidence of infection because there are an increased bacterial load when you soak it in normal saline. Tap water irrigation, lots of studies discussing that. That's what we do in our office. If it's a hand laceration, we just bring them over to the sink. We don't have the fancy, you know, you put your hand up and it automatically turns on. We just turn on the faucet for them. They irrigate it themselves, and then we take care of it. Um, lots of studies supporting just tap water irrigation in your office. How about stitches? You necessarily need to put stitches in hand lacerations. This study looked at 95 simple hand lacerations, the inclusion criteria. They need to be less than two centimeters in length, no bite punctures, no patients with diabetes, anticoagulants, or chronic steroids. They use tap water for cleaning the wound and then just put some antibiotic ointment on it. There was no difference in those wounds at three months in cosmetic appearance and the interval to return to normal activities. Treatment time, however, was significantly different, 19 minutes versus 5 minutes. Mean pain score was 31 for those that we sutured versus 13 those that we didn't. And the infection rate, there was one in the sutured wound and none that were managed conservatively. So when you're looking at hand wounds, just don't automatically think stitches. Think through the process and evaluate whether or not that patient actually needs those because cosmetically, et cetera, there is no difference. Now, bites. Bites are a concern when they come into our office. Um, they have a bad reputation, and there's a large referral bias to say, you know, you probably ought to go see the surgeon, etc. Less than a third of bites will actually present in the first 12 hours. Most of them will wait a little while. Um, if it's a human bite, we worry about staph and strep and polymicrobial. If it's a dog or a cat, then it's pasturella, which is common. I actually had a patient present to my uh, urgent care one night that was bitten by her lizard. She had an iguana and was kissing it. Why well, you would kiss an iguana? And it bit her cheek and took a big chunk out of her cheek. And that was a, an interesting one. We definitely had to approach the literature on that and figure out what to do with that one. Um, you want to use ocephalosporin uh, if appropriate, but penicillins to cover pastorella. Stray dogs or stray animals. This cartoon, there's a gentleman in the yard pounding in a uh, sign that says, Beware of dog. The dog is hanging up a sign on the fence that says, Beware of the jerk with masculinity issues. Now, I take offense to that. I have two beautiful German shepherds and they're good-sized dogs, so uh, I'm not sure what that says about me. We worry about rabies in dogs. That's what everybody's concerned about. You know, your dog barks at somebody or nips at somebody, and they're, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm going to get rabies from that. Between 1980 and 1996, there's been 32 deaths from rabies in the United States. Eleven of those were exposed in a foreign country, not even in the U.S., and six of those was a dog bite in a foreign country. Now, we, we like to travel a bit, and 
South and Central America, we tend to go down there quite often, and there are dogs everywhere in those countries. And so I'm assuming that's probably where those came from. There was no history of animal exposure in about 25 of those cases, and there was actually a domestic bat bite in one of them. I'm not sure exactly what a domestic bat is, but uh, maybe the same lady that has the iguana. Uh, incubation period for rabies is about 53 to 150 days. And so you're not out of the woods in a short period of time. Those folks need to be watched and monitored for a little while. Now, how do you monitor whether or not patients are at risk for getting rabies? You should treat immediately if someone's been bitten by a skunk, raccoon, bat, fox, or a woodchuck. But no treatment is, is required if it's just livestock, a rodent, most commonly the ones we find in our homes as our children's pets, or a lagomorph, which is a rabbit or a hare. They just don't carry rabies. Um, how to avoid treatment. So the patient says, look, I just don't want to go through it. I trust that this dog is fine. You still probably ought to observe the dog for 10 days or cat or ferret. If the animal's astray, you can do one of two things. You can either euthanize the animal and they can examine the brain or just, again, observe that animal for 10 days. And animal control is very used to doing this for us. We've called them and they'll come and round up the animal and do the observations for us. If it's an unprovoked attack, it's more likely to indic indicate a rabid animal. I spent some time in Ohio, and there was a gentleman that uh, we met out there that had been attacked by a raccoon. He was standing in his yard. The raccoon ran out of the woods towards him and ran up his leg and bit his hand. And so that would definitely be a rabid animal as opposed to an animal that uh, is sane. Currently vaccinated dogs, cats, or ferrets, really they're very unlikely to become infected, and so you don't need to worry about those nearly as much. Um, suturing animal bites. We were always taught in medical school and residency, you never suture an animal bite. Um, this study uh, says that uh, after primary closure of these various bites, uh, there was only about a 5.5% infection rate. Now, before looking at the study, I was under the understanding that if you closed it, boy, everything was going to get infected and you were going to get in trouble, etc. But this seems to indicate that infection rate is fairly low, even if you do close an animal bite. Um, another study indicated that uh, out of 769 dog bite victims, 2.1% had infection if, if, you didn't, if you didn't close them uh, at follow-up. Predictors for infection of an animal bite was the wound depth, the wound requiring debridement, and female sex, the victim, again, not the dog. So... Um, do we give antibiotics for every animal bite? The estimated cumulative risk of infection is 16%. Relative risk, if given antibiotics, 0.56 with a 95% confidence interval. The number needed to treat to prevent one infection was 14, and really the cost of benefit to that is unknown. Again, same as the previous study, infection rate was 9%. 3.8% would benefit from antibiotic number needed to treat was 26. If you saw 100 dog bites, that means that you can prevent 3.8 infections at the cost of $526 per infection. Rather steep price to pay. Um, final word. No evidence that the use of prophylactic antibiotics is effective for cat or dog bites. And there is evidence that the use of antibiotic prophylaxis after bites of the hand reduces infection, but confirmatory research is needed. I think I broke something. Everybody that twists an ankle thinks they've broken it for some reason. Uh, it's just common. They're coming in swearing that they have a broken bone in their leg. And uh, this is thanks to my prison uh, doctor friend. No, is he here? Uh, <laughs> we, uh, this is a fairly significant broken bone. Um, and you don't need x-rays, I don't think, to determine that that's probably broken. Um, the common one that we see in the summertime is I twisted my ankle. Less than 15% of ankle x-rays are positive for a fracture. Physicians tend to think, and patients especially, tend to think that, oh, every x-ray is going to be positive for a fracture. The Ottawa ankle rules still apply. Um, they really do safely rule out x-rays, and I was amazed as I reviewed that literature, the sensitivity and specificity of the, of the Ottawa ankle rules really are remarkable. The mechanism of injury for the Ottawa ankle rules to apply, it needs to be a twist, a fall, or blunt trauma, 
And if it, they're 18 years or younger, the Ottawa rules do not apply to that population. And so really this is an, it applies to the adults. To review those, you only need to get ankle films if um, there's pain in the malleolar zone and bone tenderness on the posterior edge of the lateral malleolus, bone tenderness of the posterior edge of the medial malleolus, or the inability to bear weight immediately and in the urgent care or in the emergency department. Uh, you may want to also consider getting a foot x-ray if you have um, pain in the midfoot zone and bone tenderness on the base of the fifth metatarsal, uh, bone tenderness on the navicular, or the inability to bear weight again. And those are the Ottawa rules. Um, to assess, you just need to take, have them take four steps. And usually what we do as in our office is we just watch the MA room the patient. If they're not taking any steps and are unwilling to put any weight on that foot, then we kind of have an idea that we're probably into using the Ottawa rules. If they're hobbling in or able to, you know, put weight on that foot, then really they don't apply automatically. Um, 27 studies with 15,581 patients in the Ottawa rules False negative rate was 0.3% and sensitivity 97.6%. That's pretty good for any test. 97.6% for that test is, uh, is pretty good. So what do you mean no x-rays? We're worried about malpractice. It's fairly insignificant if you follow the rules, the Ottawa ankle rules. The patient's expectation is a radiograph. The doctor's, doctor's perception sometimes that there is a high fracture rate, although as noted earlier, really that's not true. The way to avoid those is to communicate with your patient. We kind of go back to the basics. If you talk to your patient, you let them know what you're doing, you let them know that the research has been done, usually they'll go away quite satisfied. Um, do a thorough exam on the patient explaining what you're doing and explain that a chip off the bone is treated exactly the same way as a sprain. You don't necessarily need to cast, et cetera, if it's simply a chip, and you'll save a lot of time and you'll save a lot of money if you simply follow those rules. What about mobilization of ankles? Uh, this test determined two days of an elastic wrap or an ACE wrap and then an air stirrup versus putting them on splint or crutches. There was, uh, for, as far as pain after three weeks, the mobile group, 57% still had pain. The immobile group, 87%. Fairly significant, so we're actually increasing their pain when we take them off their foot. Return to work in 10 days, 54% in the mobile group could return to work, only 13% in the immobile group, and then one-year re-injury rate, really not a huge difference, 5 and 8%. And so uh, the recommendation on this study is you don't need to put the patient non-weight-bearing and on crutches. Um, ACE wraps, elastic wrap three to five days versus nothing, the scoring system was twofold, subjective and objective. Pain and function based upon patient's assessment and physician's assessment at three and five days of swelling, mobility, and pain on passive movement. There was no difference in any category whether or not you put an ACE wrap. Now, I will tell you that my patients, they like to have us have done something for them. And since there's no difference, we put an ACE wrap on them and say, okay, you're, you're good and this is going to make you better. And there is some effect, I think, still to that of telling them this will heal you, kind of like my children and their Band-Aids. Um, there are also Ottawa knee rules to determine whether or not you need to get an x-ray on a knee. Anyone complaining of knee pain older than 55 years old, uh, you get a knee film. If they are younger than that and have tenderness at the head of the fibula, tenderness of the patella, are unable to flex the knee at 90 degrees, or unable to bear weight for, again, the four steps that we talked about in the ankle rules, then you need to get a knee film and take a look at that. The other one that we commonly see in the summertime with our football players and in the fall uh, uh, is uh, clavicular fractures. So do we do the figure of eight or do we do the sling? Uh, this study compared 20 and 20 of those on the uh, figure of eight straps, four of those straps, they developed a swollen blue arm, perhaps a little tight on there. Uh, one strap actually had axillary skin breakdown, and the long-term follow-up, uh, all of them achieved full painless range of motion. 
Um, and that has been my experience. I have two sons, both of which have fractured their clavicles, and uh, we essentially just put them in a sling for convenience when they were out and about. The rest of the time, we did nothing for them. They healed up just fine. So um, the dangerous nails that we're all worried about, right? The rusty nails in which tetanus grows. Um, I've done this before. It's not very fun. Uh, <laughs> there are several risk zones when you step on a nail. Highest risk is the forefoot. Lowest risk is the midfoot, and that actually tends to be where most people put a nail through is the forefoot. And then moderate risk is right there at the heel. Soaking is no benefit when you've stepped on a nail. Again, remember the previous study we talked about with hand lacerations, when you soak uh, in normal saline, you increase the bacterial load. This can be true here as well. Coring is no benefit. Uh, plantar puncture, especially the high-risk patient, um, or if there's a forefoot wound or through an athletic shoe, there is, a, uh, there is indication to use an antibiotic. High-risk patients include those with peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, and are otherwise immunocompromised. So the dilemma, foot osteomyelitis after puncture through a sneaker of pseudomonas. Treatment of choice would be a second generation or a third generation fluoroquinolone, not approved for children, and um, is a sh short course is safe. The problem is, is that children are commonly the ones that are stepping on nails, not necessarily adults, and are commonly the ones that are putting it through their sneakers. And so you have a, an issue with those fluoroquinolones um, and children. Okay, so those of us in family practice, how many of you guys see back pain every day? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, primary care physicians. I'm sure our, our OBGYNs are probably the same uh, for different reasons. But um, back pain is kind of the bane of the existence of family practitioners. It's a rough thing to deal with. And it's always good, particularly considering the information that we received this morning on our narcotic issue in Utah, it's always good to review the data and perhaps have some armament in helping those patients feel better. So back basics. The initial assessment needs to be to determine the source of the pain, and there are lots of diseases that refer pain to the back. Red flags for indicating severe disease, and we'll go over those, and probably most of us know those. Those are drilled into our heads in uh, medical school and residency which tests are needed, and then, of course, how to treat the pain. And hopefully we can get by without uh, doing narcotics for back pain. Pain that is referred to the back from systemic disease. Kidney stones, pyelonephritis, pancreatitis, the list goes on and on. Cholecystitis, peptic ulcer. Had a patient in my office just this uh, last week, initially presented to um, uh, another physician within the community with some back pain, was... Uh, was not treated, came to me, ends up that it was cholecystitis, and uh, we were uh, able to send it to some friends of ours, the general surgeons that were able to help us out in removing her back pain for her because her gallbladder was bad. Peptic ulcer disease, triple A's, um, and these can usually be ruled out with just a history and physical. We're going to be doing that anyway. Um, they also have other symptoms. Red flags. These are the red flags that we've all been taught, okay? Um, Older patients particularly, we worry about cancer. Those folks have constitutional symptoms. Um, compression fractures, pathologic compression fractures, we worry about there being significant other issues in those folks. Uh, weight loss, those folks feel much worse at night, their back pain does, and tends to not get better with rest. Infections, especially in our diabetics and in our IV drug users, uh, we worry about spinal osteomyelitis, or an epidural abscess. I actually have a patient that we take care of that um, is a quadriplegic because of his drug use problems, has been in the prison system, uh, visiting our friend from yesterday, and, um, and he had this uh, spinal epidural abscess from his IV drug use. Um, very debilitating for him at a very young age. True emergencies, cord compression or cauda equina syndrome. Incontinence, you get them out of your office. Um, leg weakness, neurologic deficits, they need to be uh, at the hospital and fairly quickly in the hand of a surgeon to decompress the spine. 
causes can be fracture, cancer, infections, but uh, again, they need to be at the hospital to get an MRI and again get in the hands of a surgeon. Root, uh, nerve root compression versus cord compression. How to identify which one you have on your hands. Uh, nerve root compression tends to be unilateral. Sensory deficit tends to follow a dermatome, and there is decreased or absent tendon reflexes, whereas you get almost the opposite with central cord compression. It is bilateral. The sensory deficit is bilateral and below the level of compression in the spine. Uh, you do have incontinence with that and hyperreflexia, not decrease or absent reflexes. The foot. The foot is the window to the back. If you take a look at the foot and where they have uh, neurologic deficits, their motor and sensory and reflexes, you can really tell where the herniation is on their nerve root. About 90% of those are between L5 and S1. And that's I would say that in my experience, that is definitely backed up with what we see in our office. Um, the L5 uh, sensory tends to be the dorsal foot, the space between the first and second toes. And when you have an S1 nerve root compression, it's the lateral aspect of the foot. Those are pretty easy to determine where their compression is. Uh, resource utilization. This study was done between chiropractors, which patients go see chiropractors for their back pain, orthopedics, and family practitioners. Um, the, uh, the number of visits or x-rays were done in 33% in primary care. It's a small study, 70% in orthopedics and 70% in chiropractors. Um, and incidentally, the end of the study, there was really no significant findings on any of those x-rays. And so resource utilization, uh, x-rays are not commonly required for your common everyday uh, back pain that comes in. Let's talk about treatment for back pain. Non-steroidals versus placebos. Four studies show benefit of using non-steroidals versus other things, um, versus placebos. Non-steroidals versus acetaminophen. 300 patients with acute musculoskeletal uh, injury, uh, acetaminophen, indomethacin, and diclofenac, or acetaminophen plus diclofenac is how they were treated. At two hours and at three days, there was no statistical difference in their pain and no clinical difference. Uh, combination therapy is associated with slightly higher adverse effects. So in our office, we use Tylenol. If the patient says, well, Tylenol just doesn't work, then we pull out magic ibuprofen. If that doesn't work, we try to go to naproxen uh, before we uh, get to anything uh, more significant. Muscle relaxers versus placebo. There were nine randomized controls, controlled trials that were review, reviewed. Seven showed some benefit of the muscle relaxer. The benefit lasted only about four to seven days. The benefit lasted only that long. And then other studies that showed muscle relaxer versus non-steroidals, um, no additive benefit if you, uh, if you add the uh, uh, muscle relaxer to the non-steroidal. Now let's talk about opioids. There's no studies on opioids versus placebo. I personally would like to see that study. I'm always fascinated when uh, pharmaceutical representatives come to the office and say, look, here's our drug. Placebo helped 37% of patients, and our drug helped 52% of patients. And I think, well, how do we maximize that 37%? Because uh, that's a pretty good deal. But there are no studies uh, testing opioids versus placebo. So they've tested opioids versus non-steroidals. Um, two of those studies were with codeine, another one with oxycodone. In the codeine study, there was no difference. In the oxycodone, they were better on the first three days only. And then pain was exactly the same, whether they were taking oxycodone or non-steroidals. And they could return to work at exactly the same time. So in my mind, considering the problem that we have in Utah, the preference would be treat with your non-steroidals, let the patient know this information so that they're aware, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to get by. What about bed rest? People with back pain tend to want to lay down. And this, this tells us that if you lay down all the time because your back hurts, you're going to slow your recovery. Early return to activity and early return to work tends to work out better. Your, your back is meant to be upright, is what I tell patients. It's not meant to be horizontal. It's meant to be vertical. So the more often you're vertical, the quicker your spine is going to heal. You do want to limit precautions. You don't want to have the patient 
going to work lifting, you know, 250-pound pipe, et cetera. Um, but you do want them to be up and out of bed and moving around, resuming as many of their normal activities as they can. Physical therapy. What about physical therapy for back pain? Exercise and physical therapy studies are conflicting. For acute pain, there's probably no benefit for physical therapy. But those that come in with chronic pain, that month after month, they're telling you, my back hurts, my back hurts, you've not found any significant pathology, physical therapy may be helpful for those folks. Manipulation, such as um, chiropractic, uh, physical therapy, um, there's no difference among manipulation, physical therapy, and uh, giving educational pamphlet on back care. And so since I don't do high-speed manipulation like chiropractors do and I don't do physical therapy in the office, we give them a handout on back pain, say here's what you can do at home. The studies say that there's no difference if you do this or go to a physical therapist, and they tend to do fairly well. PENS unit versus TENS units. The uh, PENS unit just tends to be uh, a little bit uh, better. More pain reduction, better sleep, and less use of an analgesic. Acupuncture, no high-quality studies. Another one I'm quite interested in, what do you use as your control group for acupuncture? I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but there is some suggestion that it offers some benefit. Calcitonin, uh, elderly patients with vertebral compression fractures, offers good pain relief, but it is fairly expensive. This study done by OSHA says that uh, back belts offer no protection against injury. And the biggest predictor of injury is that you've had a previous back injury. And so putting a patient in a back belt, we see them wearing them at Home Depot and Lowe's, actually does not affect whether or not you're going to have uh, an injury. Strep throat. This cartoon's far sides, my favorite uh, cartoon. It says, quit complaining. For one thing, chicken soup is good for a cold. For another, it's nobody we know. <laughs> Some sore throat facts. Strep throat is very rare in infants less than one years old. How mothers know their one-year-old or less than one-year-old's throat is sore, I don't know. I'm not a mother. But they come in saying, hey, my six-month-old has a sore throat. Um, it's also very uncommon in two-year-olds, uh, less than two-year-olds. Uh, strep pharyngitis tends to peak between four and seven years of age. And there is a seasonal variation. We see it a lot more in the winter season. The most common cause of a sore throat, of course, is a virus. Uh, the majority of them is rhinovirus and adenovirus. There are some others that account for about 5%. Epstein-Barr, which causes the mono, parainfluenza, coronavirus. Uh, the uh, group A beta-hemolytic beta strep is about 15%. That peaks in the late winter and early spring, and the incubation is about two to five days. Large majority of adults, with acute pharyngitis have a self-limited illness. If we can have them not take the antibiotics, as was spoken of in the earlier discussion, uh, they really will get better. Um, adults with a sore throat that is strep throat is about 5 to 15%, just like it is in children when they come to your office. So what do we do? Um, offer appropriate analgesic, antipyretic, and other supportive care. You clinically screen adults with pharyngitis. And do not test or treat patients with a zero or one on the Kentor scale as they don't need it. So the Kentor scale, history of fever, tonsillar exudates, no cough or anterior cervical lymphadenitis. If you have a four or uh, if you have a four, 30 to 60 percent of those will have strep and those are the group that we test. The zero to one, you don't need to test them. Really, it's minimal and... Um, two to three, just about 5%. Um, again, that reviews that data there. Throat culture is not recommended for routine primary evaluation of patients with a sore throat or to confirm negative rapid strep tests in your office. Uh, if you do come up with a rapid strep, preferred antibiotic is penicillin or erythromycin. Mono, we've all seen the kissing disease in our office with the uh, adolescents. They tend to have a very severe sore throat. It is horrible. That is the number one thing that they are complaining about. Uh, you tend to find the pharyngitis that looks like white, wet leather. Treatment is just supportive. I tell patients we can do a monospot test, but I'm not going to do anything different if it turns up positive. 
And so they are pretty okay with not going through with that, uh, with that test. Bronchitis is back. Um, more than 90% of acute bronchitis is viral. It does account, though, for 30% of antibiotic prescriptions in the U.S., even though 90% is viral. And we tend to think, well, is it green sputum? Because if it's green, boy, that's bacterial, but that does not indicate a bacterial infection. Antibiotics are actually prescribed on 60% of office visits for bronchitis, and we use broad-spectrum antibiotics in about 25%, so we're really overusing our antibiotics in this case. Uh, 28,000 doctor visits in this study. Uh, bronchitis and URI accounted for 21% of those prescriptions, and the rate of prescribing antibiotics for colds, it was 51%, URI 52%, and bronchitis, you can see, jumped up to 66%. So we're giving out antibiotics all the time for something that is 90% viral. Um, beta agonists do help with the cough. We try to tell patients your cough will last three to six weeks post-bronchitis. So don't expect it to go away before that time. But we do on occasion prescribe them some albuterol because it does help uh, at least patients feel that it helps a little bit with the cough. But um, studies show that there's actually no difference in um, productive cough or persistent night cough. How about smokers? Lots of studies. Four showed no benefit of treating with antibiotics. Three percent showed a tiny benefit in smokers. One showed tiny benefit to both, and one showed a trend to improve among non-smokers, but not among smokers. So really, it's kind of, data is not supportive of necessarily giving every smoker that has bronchitis antibiotics. Expectations for the patient. We interviewed 30 family physicians, 30 patients treated for bronchitis. The physician acknowledged that bronchitis is usually viral, but the patients felt that they would not be improved unless they were seen by a physician. Now, this is not that they would improve if they were given an antibiotic. They simply needed to be seen. We have some magic healing powers, apparently. If they see us, they will be healed. Um, all the patients that got a prescription, uh, 27 out of 30 of those received an antibiotic. All physicians believe that patients expected an antibiotic. But again, remember, they expected to be better because they saw the physician. Three quarters felt pressured by the patient. Some felt pressured by the employer, legal system, or insurers. Really, the take-home message is, if you have a booklet or some patient information about the natural course of bronchitis, and then you send them home with the prescription saying, if you're not better in X amount of days, go ahead and fill this, those that had the book, 42% is all that filled the prescription and, and took their antibiotics. Those that did not have any information to take home with them on antibiotics, 62% uh, filled the prescription. So just patient information and education is helpful to decrease uh, the use of antibiotics to be prescribed. In the end, call it a chest cold. People think that bronchitis requires antibiotics. Colds do not. That tends to be the general uh, consensus in the population. And so you have a chest cold and you don't need antibiotics. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Ribbs. Maybe in the interest of time, if you have a question for Dr. Riggs, you can come ask him. Otherwise, we'll just see everyone tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Thanks so much for your attendance.